How's everyone doing? We can start with a little prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. On this first day, Palm Sunday of Holy Week, let us invite the Holy Spirit to fill our memory, and the Son to fill our intellect, and the Father to fill our will, so that the Holy Trinity may take up its dwelling in us, and make of us other Christ to those in the world. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, well, today it's Sunday. That's eight o'clock here in Italy. And I'd like to start with an informal question and answer, if you will. You can start by sharing with us where you're from, those of you who are joining in. What country or what state you're from? Miami, best place ever. Oh, is it? Okay. You, so. you were in Fort Lauderdale when I missed you. I didn't know you were there. Oh, that was last year, yeah? Or was that this year? Okay. Uh. Northern Nevada. Steve. Nevada, okay. Steve, uh, um, Long Island, New York. I saw okay. you about 20 years ago at the Divine Will Center, St. Joseph Center, Patch of New York. Yes, that's where I was born in Bayshore. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, wow. Yeah. Canada. Welcome. We're from England, Mark and Julian. Hello, Father. Hello. Good evening. Thank you. New Hampshire. When? New Hampshire, okay. When do you turn uh, back the clock in England? Last or week in March. Forward? Oh, you did. We In Italy, we don't do it till the end of the month, okay. Yes, it will be the last, the last week in March, the end of the month. Same as okay. you. California, California, Los Angeles. Los Angeles, okay. California, Los Angeles. Welcome. Thank you. The Angels. We are from Calgary. Calgary, Canada. Thank you. Cowboy yes, country. But, sorry if I... Calgary, yeah. that's where they have the rodeos. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes, the Stampede. Hello. The well-known Stampede. Calling. I'm calling from Colombia. Nice to have you from Colombia. Richard, from the country of Brooklyn. Queens, Nassau, Suffolk, everywhere. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, those are two of the five boroughs. <laughs> we moved a lot, yes. Canton, Georgia. Georgia. Hi, Father Picola from Peru. Peru. Very nice. Nice to have you. Nice, France. What? France. Good to have you as well. Merci. Germany. 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 Welcome. 
Thank you. Michael from Ireland. Ireland. The fighting Irish. Yeah, the Italians and the Irish, the two eyes. Not, not anymore. No. Oh. You know, I'll tell you a little joke. No offense. But um, I know this, this man, he passed away recently named Ben Healy from Ireland. He was Irish, but he lived in, in um, Rhode Island. And oh, he, yeah. he, he would tell jokes. And one of the jokes was about the Irish flag and the Italian flag. And he said, what's the difference? He said, an Irish flag is an Italian flag left out in the sun too long. <laughs> that's, that's, no that's offense, okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for the good humor. Yes. Um, yeah. Well, thank you all for joining in. Does anyone have yeah. any question? Go ahead. I want to. I want to ask something very informal. Do you think yes. Italians and Irish have like sort of this temper because of religion or, or culture? Or what do you reckon, Father? I think it's all the above. I think that being living in Italy all this all these years, I do believe it's in the blood. There's definitely that genetic trait to the the, the faith. But for now, faith doesn't have any, anything to do with physicality, yes, but um, when the a culture is impregnated with these religious symbols and you grow up and see these little shrines on the street, you know, um, I think that that's something that is part of the person's uh, outlook in life in general. And that's passed on, even without saying anything to the children. You have in public religious symbols, things like that. And you, it definitely affects you. And uh, so the culture and the faith, I think they're, they're espoused in, in Ireland, in Italy, because of the great faith of the great saints that God had blessed it with. But today, you know, there's a crisis of faith. And France was probably the country blessed, perhaps second to none, with all the great saints God gave France. And then Italy too, you know. But today we're going through this challenge, this, this faith crisis. And um, yeah, it's, it's not as easy as it was back then to believe. <laughs> it was a lot easier back then, I thought, I suppose. Father, we have uh, Gabby. Uh, Father, two questions. Yeah. The first yeah. one is, what is the difference between volition and will? We have not this word volition in, in German, and I like it very much. I was Googling it, and um, if I yeah, know it right now, it means as a, it involves also the free will, the act of the free will volition, and, um, and in volition, I can more imagine this ocean <laughs> who is uh, yeah, God speaking about, uh, about his will. And the second question is, what is daughter sign in the divine will today um, at Palm Sunday? What is this meaning? Is, was he coming into Louisa? Was she like daughter sign? Yeah, these are my questions. <laughs> Thank you. All right, thank you. You're welcome. In answer to the question, what's the difference between volizione, volere, and volontà? These are three Italian words that Jesus used with Louisa. Volere. V-O-L-E-R-E -E, is the operative will, the will when it's operating. Volontà, V-O-L-O-N-T with an accent over the last A, volontà, the last letter, that is the natural faculty of desire. So the, the soul has three faculties. It has the intellect, the memory, and the will. The will in and of itself is volontà, the natural will that God endows us with. Volere, again, is when you're engaging that volontà in motion and operation, it becomes volere. Volizione is when it is the informed will. So the operative will is volere. The informed will, using the intellect, is vo volizione, V-O-L-O-Z-I-O-N-E. Now, in English, we don't have these distinctions. All we have is one word for all three, and that is will. But in Italian, they have three different words for will. Volere, volontà, volizione. So we can say in English that the volere, again, is the operative will, the volizione is the informed will, and the volontà is the natural will. Okay. 
And the other question you asked was about something to do with Palm Sunday. I don't, is that right? sign, um, who, 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 I don't, I don't know what is really daughter sign. Is it Mary's Immaculate Heart or is this like the divine will when you um, yeah, have this, the divine will that he is coming into you to, to daughter sign like he is um, this marriage feast when he's speaking about we will come with the father and uh, yeah, have, have marriage with you. Yeah, with you. <laughs> yeah, you're referring to the passage where Jesus says, I will come with the Father and we will take up our abode in him. Is that are you referring to that? Or to today's yes. gospel? Is this, is this the meaning when, when he's saying, uh, daughter sign, sign, I come to you and with this donkey and that he's then coming? Um, I'm not sure which passage you're referring to. Could you, do you remember what? gospel it is over uh, today today's gospel when he's uh, saying um to oh, say, you, yeah. you mean when he was going to prepare for his dinner the last supper he yeah today, man, today's um yeah. last reading mm -hmm. yes yes okay it was a long one today yeah we had the narrator we had uh, our disciple you had the, the group the, the crowd you had jesus yeah um Jesus said he would, he would, there would be a man, right? I am, I'm, I'm in Italian, I did an Italian, so I don't remember the English, but I remember the Italian. But he said that he would um, have a dinner in the upper room, and you would know that, let me see if I could pull it up in English. I found it in German. It's, uh, it's like, rejoice, daughter Zion, rejoice, Jerusalem. See, your king is coming to you. Uh, he is oh, just and is helping. Okay. He is, yeah. This, this is what I mean. And you said there's a sign in that passage. Yes, it's a uh, rejoice daughter sign. And what this daughter sign mean? Is it like Louisa? Oh, Zion. Yes, Zion. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's my, okay. My yes. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Jerusalem represents the blessed mother. The blessed mother. And um, this is a symbol of the Blessed Mother. The, I'll explain this to you in a moment. Um, it's in my book, The Splendor of Creation. Okay, I found it. So when presenting the future church, Paul, when he wrote his letter to the Ephesians, he wrote it while he was in prison. And in this, he talks about the bride being presented to the bridegroom, meaning the church, presenting itself without blemish, spot, stain, or wrinkle to Christ for this nuptial. And the future church as a holy immaculate bride before Christ bears with it a Greek word. Paul, when he wrote, he used the word immaculate, okay? And that word in Greek, immaculate, describes the positive quality of um, the church in the future. St. Jerome brought this word from the Greek when he translated the Bible from Hebrew and Greek into Latin. He used that same word that Paul used and Paul brought it into the Vulgate. I'm sorry, Jerome brought it into the Vulgate as Immaculatus in Latin and it's attributed to the Blessed Virgin Mary as if to designate Mary as the prototype of the future church. The New Testament develops this theme in two notable passages from the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts. In Gabriel's greeting to Mary, hail full of grace. Saint Luke re-echoes the Old Testament prophet who says that what you just read, daughter Zion, rejoice. So Luke in chapter one, verse 28 states, um, that the angel Gabriel says hail and this hail is not a simple salutation but an exaltation it means exult, rejoice, full of grace such an exalting greeting and um, is found again in the Old Testament Isaiah, it's also found in Zephaniah Joel, Zechariah who triumphantly addresses the daughter of Zion, Jerusalem which is the religious center of Israel it says, rejoice exceedingly, daughter of Zion. See, your king shall come to you, but just Savior is he. 
And the Greek fathers commonly taught that Luke's narration of Mary's angelic salutation re-echo the Old Testament salutation to the entire house of Israel. The king is in this passage has been traditionally regarded as the Messiah, while the daughter of Zion represents the induction of Jerusalem at the end of the age, the eschatological era of universal peace and Israel's new religious center of the Hebrews and Gentiles together within her walls. So it's basically the 12 tribes of Israel being brought gathered back together and they will, the church will be as immaculate as Mary. So it represents the immaculate state of Mary and of the future church, this greeting. And um, this cross reference is the key point to, the, um, to this passage. Uh, and that's found also in Luke's gospel. And um, there's a scripture scholar by the name of Aristotle Sierra. And he stated that comparing these two, that um, Luke foresees in the Holy Spirit's overshadowing of Mary, the prototype of universal holiness in the era of peace when the divine will reigns on earth. So when the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary, he revealed the manner by which she will overshadow the reborn Jerusalem, the daughter of Zion. And the Second Vatican Council presents Mary as the model of the type of the church in the future. It states, and this comes from Second Vatican Council document entitled um, Lumen Gentium, Article 68, it states, the mother of Jesus is the image and the beginning of the church as it is perfected in the world to come, unquote. And also the Second Vatican Council document in Genesis Article 63 adds, the Blessed Virgin is a type, typus of the church in the order of faith, charity, and perfect union with Christ, unquote. So one may foresee the Holy Spirit's overshadowing of Mary as a marvelous sign of the new Pentecost. When the Holy, when the, he, or the Holy Spirit overshadowed the entire church, the entire house of Israel at the dawn of this eschatological era, which we're living in now. And um, yeah, so there's, there's strong parallels between the two. Even St. Louis de Montfort prophesied that into the end of time, before the final coming of Christ, Mary will produce the marvels which will be seen in the latter times. The formation and education of the great saints will come at the end of the world and they are reserved to Mary. He also states towards the end of the world, Almighty God and his Holy Mother are to raise up great saints who will surpass in holiness most other saints. And Maximian Colby was another one who attributed to Mary the immaculate state of the future church, that she will be the one imparting to us the state of immaculacy, which is really her state. Okay, another question? Janet, go ahead, Janet. Uh, Father, I was just wondering, a lot of people ask, what, what place does recreation have in our Divine Will Day and what are appropriate kinds of recreation? Is it better to do an active thing like going for a walk or, or is it okay to watch TV? Just uh, some guidelines. Yeah. Sure. The Lord wants us to have a balanced life. And there are certain things we do in life that help us unwind, help us um, like get rid of the nerves, the stress from the daily work. And that's where recreation comes in. St. Thomas Aquinas spoke of this. He called it um, holy leisure. That's the word he used, holy leisure. And St. Maximian Kolbe, when he was the rector of the seminary in Poland, would tell the students, get outside of the library, leave, go play soccer. <laughs> he would tell them to do that because if you stay and read and just pray all day, meaning on your knees, then that's not quite a balance, quite a balanced lifestyle. Even Louisa had things that did not involve prayer, like sewing, doing, preparing things for the church. And it's healthy to have that. There's nothing wrong with watching television. You know, it's just a matter of the programs you watch. And of course, on television today, there are a lot of things that aren't pleasing to God, but there are some things that are too. So yeah. Nothing, nothing sinful about that. And it's good to have a balance. Yeah. Thank you. My second question, <clears throat> um, 
how long, like it's going to be a long process for you. Um, and, and tied to that is, will the translation only be available once all the volumes are completed or are they going to come out in stages? I'm not sure how they will come out. I would think probably one volume at a time. I don't think I want to hold it all up till all 36 are done. Because I think as soon as I finish one, I'll, I'll make it available to others. I don't know how, you know, how to do that. But once I finish, then I think the Holy Spirit or will send me someone to help me get, get it out to people the right way. I'm, I'm not there yet. I'm still working on volume one. I think volume one will have the most footnotes of all the volumes because it sets the stage for all the volumes. And a lot of the expressions Louisa uses throughout the volumes are found in volume one. And I have to be careful that I transmit her intended meaning. I'll give you an example. I used the example before in the last talk about confusion. Doesn't mean confusion in English as the Italian um, expresses it. Another word that I had to struggle with for a while until I finally realized what it meant was paura. Louisa uses three words for fear in volume one when the demons were attacking her. But it wasn't just toward the demons, it was also toward God. So she had what you call paura, timore, and spavento. These are three Italian ones for fear. Spavento is dread, that kind of fear. Then you have timore, which is the fear of God. That's not a bad fear, it's a good fear. It's like a holy respect. And then you have paura, which is fright. When she was dealing with the demons, she would oftentimes use this word, um, timore, which is used for God. Sometimes she would use spavento, but sometimes timore, which is a holy fear. So I thought to myself, why would she have a holy fear toward the demons? Jesus told her to despise them. That's the word he uses in Italian, despise the demons. But, <clears throat> You have to understand what that meant to spice. It means spite them. It just meant they don't deserve your time, your attention, that kind of way. Um, but the word that I'm going to pull it up here because I brought it up now and might as well look at it. That uh, she uses. She uses it quite a few times, and I put a footnote on this on purpose to make sure that whenever she uses it in the future, we know exactly what she's trying to say. Not all the time was it meant for fear. The proper word that she used in Italian for timore is trepidation. It's not fear. Even though it literally reads fear, that's not what it means. So in the English, I, I'm not putting fear, but I keep the original at the footnote, so people can see what word. But the actual meaning she's trying to convey is trepidation, okay? Which has, a, it's a hesitant fear, okay? And that's how she would react initially when she was, what, 12, 13, 13 years old when the attack started from 13 to 16. And she, yeah, she uh, went through some hard times, but volume one will have most of the footnotes for that reason, so that once we understand what these words are, we don't have to keep, I don't have to keep repeating in the footnotes for the following volumes. Thank you for the question. Anne, go ahead, Anne. Hi, Father. Um, in today's Gospel of Mark, it mentioned it was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. And I love the hours of the Passion, so I just need your, your insight. Um, volume 24, April 12th, 1928. It says in there uh, that he suffered three hours in terrible agony. So if I do the math from nine in the morning, um, that's six hours on the cross um, versus the three in uh, volume 24. Is there something I'm, maybe maybe it's a translation or something I'm missing? Can you read that passage that you're looking at? Which one? You said volume 24? Yep. Yeah, so volume 24, mm -hmm. the passage is, I mean, it's long, so I'm kind of going to mm -hmm. jump to the, the middle part where it says, uh, I'll just start with, in Eden, the son of the divine fiat darkened and withdrew, and it became always nighttime for man, symbolized by the sun that withdrew from the face of the earth during the three hours of my terrible agony on the cross. Mm -hmm. And then it goes on, but that's the piece mm -hmm. that I... So it's where it starts is my daughter Calvary is the new Eden 
in which mankind was given back what it lost by withdrawing from my divine will. So that's the piece. Mm -hmm. And I know somewhere yeah. else they talk, Father, about three things in threes, three hours in the agony, three different types of um, instruments in the scourging, uh, three hours of agony on the cross, things in threes. Uh, Jesus says this. So I'm just... Is, was he on the cross six hours, Father, or was he? It's, yes, it's yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. Six hours was about the time he was on the yeah, cross. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The darkness lasted three hours, right? Ah, the dark. Okay. But he was uh, there for about six hours, yeah. Okay. And Matthew talks about um, the sixth hour, the darkness fell. But okay. On the, cool. the third hour, he was crucified. The sixth, the darkness came, then the ninth is when he died, yeah. Thanks, Father. Mark and Jillian. Mark and Jillian, go ahead. Hello. Hi, hi Father. Um, it is, um, hi. We were reading um, the Book of Heaven recently, and I come across um, Jesus talking to Louisa about missing volumes. Do you have any information about that? Missing volumes? Jesus talks to Louisa about that? You mean when the volumes were given to the nuns and they couldn't find them? They did find them. Yes, they were missing for a while. St. Hannibal had the nuns in Messina uh -huh. guard the volumes and they were misplaced. But then they were eventually all found. Yeah. Oh, they were found. Okay, yes. so we do have access to those volumes then. Yes, everything? yes, they're in, they're in the 36 volumes. That they are. Okay. Some of them Great. went missing, but they found them. Yeah. Oh, they found them. Great, thank you, Father. Thanks. You're welcome. Jose, Jose, do you have a question, Jose? Um, yeah, my question would be regarding what happened yesterday. Um, there was a terrorist attack, I think, in Russia, and it remind, remind me of some of the words that Father Joseph has said about the role Russia would play in this end time. So I don't know if maybe uh, Father Joseph have, has any uh, insights regarding this incident in particular and in, in the role Russia is going to play it regarding Ukraine as well. Well, the first thing I would say is I'm not you know, in the know when it comes to politics and stuff like that. But what I do know is what our lady said at Medjugorje, that Russia would glorify her the most. And so when the ecclesially approved prophetic revelations of true life in God, this is uh, mentioned by Jesus many times. And um, I think the fruit of it that is the fruit of the consecration in 84 that was done by St. Pope John Paul II is being manifest now, we're seeing. I'm not saying Russia is a, a saint now, the country is a saint, no. But I think that it has made tremendous strides since that consecration in 84. And it wasn't the fruit of Russia's effort, it was the fruit of the Blessed Mother's effort. She, once it was consecrated to her heart, she started to move things. In fact, within a year of the consecration, everything started to change radically in Russia. Within four years, the wall fall of the Berlin Wall happened in 89. And then 1991, there was the dissolution of the Soviet Union. And now the churches in Russia are thriving. Um, so you see the fruits, you know, within four years, right from the consecration of the wall, the, the Iron Curtain fell. And um, I must say this though, again, I'm not in the politics and all that, but what I do know is that whenever you fight for life, outlaw abortion. That's good. Russia has done that. It has outlawed abortion. It has outlawed same-sex marriage. Whereas in the West, we're not doing that, are we? So I'm seeing some good fruits already that are happening. And it's going to be a war, you know, spiritual battles, spiritual war, when you have um, these forces fighting each other on moral issues. I would like to say something really, sorry. sorry. Yeah, thank you for your uh, very enriching um, uh, reply. I would like to say something regarding life. Here in my country, Colombia, I guess yes. in two years, there was this uh, law or the, like this um, thing from the court that said that abortion should be sort of a right. Not as in France in a couple of weeks ago, but they gave lots of, you know, liberties in this regard and something that struck me in a very i don't know um i, th I thought that was a very a, a, a 
yeah, a, a very special coincidence that the day they said that in Colombia, that abortion would be so freely available, the next day the war in Ukraine happens. So wow. I don't know. I'm no, <laughs> I'm no theologian by no means. I'm no, but to me it was very. It, it struck me that something maybe oh. mystical or spiritual yeah. happened in that regard. Who knows? But I only wanted to say that regarding life, and yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you, Jose. Diane, do you have a question? Yes, hi. Um, I'd like if you can please explain a little bit more um, this idea of the psychosomatic indwelling. Uh, you mm -hmm. mentioned that once, but like this, does this mean that this new indwelling has an impact on our bodies? And how is it different from um, when we, well, the the reality of this Holy Spirit indwelling that we are a temple of the Holy Spirit. Is there a difference in this new indwelling? Yeah, or? yeah there is. Um, when we are baptized, we receive the Holy Spirit and we become the temple of the Holy Spirit. Jesus tells Louisa, when I, the, the Son, as well as the Father, as well as the Spirit, all three indwell within us, God becomes our temple, okay? We are a temple of the Holy Spirit when we're baptized. When God's will reigns in a human being, God becomes the temple. And um, we become God's temple. Um, and God becomes our temple at the same time. So it's not like we lose that indwelling from baptism, rather we get an additional indwelling, so to speak. Now, naturally, all three persons are inseparable. So where there's one, there's two but not all are operating, right, um, in the same way, right? Because not the, not the Father, not the Spirit incarnated themselves, just the Son did, without leaving the Father and the Spirit. So they are distinct, but inseparable. One is sort of like the actor or the operator, whereas the other two concur in that operation. So when the Father created the universe, the Son and the Spirit concurred, but it was the Father who was doing the operating. When the Son redeemed us, it was the Son who was doing that work of redemption while the Father and the Spirit co concurred, cooperated with the Son's operation. And now that the Holy Spirit's being sent down for the third fiat, uh, giving the gift of the divine will to us, he's now operating within us while the Father and the Spirit co concur in that operation. Put it all, putting it all together, we have a tri um, psychosomatic indwelling of the three divine persons in and through the intellect, the memory, and the will, the heart, the breath, and the blood. So the Father impacts the body in as much as he impacted the heartbeat of Adam and sustained that heartbeat. It was the Father keeping that heart pumping, and that heartbeat never was never to stop. The Son was flowing through Adam's lifeblood. That would be shed in atonement for sin. And the Spirit was breathing, inhaling, and exhaling in every moment of Adam's breath. So here you have... Um, soma, by the way, is a Greek word for body, hence psychosomatic, soma. You have the trinity in the body of Adam, in the blood, the heartbeat, and the breath. Then you have it in the soul, hence CK in Greek means soul. So that's where you get psyche from. So you have the Father operating in the will of Adam, the Spirit breathing, I mean, it's not in addition to breathing, the Spirit operating in his memory, and the sun in the intellect. So here you have the three powers or faculties of the soul, the intellect, the memory, and the will in which the Father, Son, and Spirit operate, and the body, the heart, breath, and blood. Okay. So what's the impact on our body? So that's what I'm, I'm trying to um, see if there's... Yeah, when, whenever we do acts in the divine will, right? Acts, they exercise a trans-temporal influence over all creation. This is engaging the body. It's not just the soul. So when you walk, that's an act. When you breathe, that's an act. When you pick up a hammer and do work, that's an act. These externally mundane or seemingly menial actions can become eternal actions when united with God's divine will. 
because in as much as God has neither beginning nor end, and he seeks to dwell in us and therefore possess us, if we allow that to happen, our acts become God's acts. Therefore, they become eternal. And for this reason, Jesus tells Louisa that whether you're breathing or sleeping, I'm breathing and sleeping in you. And therefore, everything you do, even unconscious, is a divine act. When she would do the rounds, right, she would assimilate her, herself with all creatures. And in so doing, impact them in a way that without the divine will, we would not be able to do. So Louisa was able to eternally influence all things of all time in one tiny little act. <laughs> so that engages the body, these acts, not just the soul. The blinking of your eyes, you're talking, all these can become divine acts that have an eternal influence over all things. And this was not possible before the gift of living in the divine world was actualized. Adam and Eve had it, Jesus and Mary had it, but no one else. Now that the Holy Spirit's um, sanctifying us, principally through the will. Of the three faculties, the greatest is the will. It's not the intellect, it's not the memory. Because only in the will are all these acts deposited and the soul expands, okay? And these acts are made up of physical actions as well as spiritual actions. Um, and in that sense, uh, the body is essential for us to do these acts, okay? Now, Louisa didn't do much physical activity. She was in bed, right? But nonetheless, everything she was doing from breathing to writing to speaking to was engaging the brain, engaging the mind, right? That's the body. And uh, yeah, the arms as well. Yeah. Hey, that's kind of mind blowing. <laughs> yeah, it is. These are acts of faith, you know? It's like you want to see, see results, but you don't see anything. It's like what I saw, let's say, a saint do 50 years ago, like Mother Teresa of Calcutta. I see other people doing well. What makes that person's actions different than this person's? It's the intention. It's the power of the divine will within that individual that we don't see physically. That we carry these acts out as we go to the sacrament of confession or communion, right? You don't necessarily feel forgiven when you receive the sacrament of confession, but you know you're forgiven. Mm -hmm. So these are acts of faith. Same with these divine acts in the divine will. Just quickly, last, last thing regarding this, does this have in any way an impact on our health too? Impact on, you said vows? On our health, I mean, on health? our health. I think so. I mean, if you take, for example, the sacrament of anointing, right? That's given in case of like a possibility of death. And people have literally been healed from that anointing. They've gotten yeah. better and they've, so we know that the sacramental grace that the sacrament produces can literally heal. And if these divine acts are acts of God, they can heal as well. Mm -hmm. So that's up to God ultimately, if he wants to heal or to improve. Okay, you thank you very much. You, you, you're welcome. Stephen, okay. Stephen, go ahead, Stephen. Good evening, Father. Good evening. Uh, question uh, about these uh, words that Louisa used and I got already a catechesis about this but I'm not all my doubts were dispelled it's about the word fusione and fondere that means that uh, we are uh, melting in the divine will and uh, the teaching of the church is that the human nature and the divine nature they cannot mingle together they cannot become one so I was scared at the moment that there is maybe something heretical to be seen, but I, yeah. I, no, there's nothing, there's nothing heretical. What the Council of Trent condemned was confusion, not fusion. So mm -hmm. it condemned that there's a confusion of natures, right? There is no confusion. In fact, I think it was Pope Leo who made that as a dogmatic statement before the Council of, of Trent. Um, it was a, Leo's letter to Flaviano, I think that's what it was, where he talks about how the divine will operating in Christ did not experience any confusion. Now, let's see if I could find the statement here. Um, here it is. 
among the early ecumenical councils that helped formulate the doctrine of the two wills, the divine will and the human will in Jesus Christ, you have Chalcedon, these early ecumenical, ecumenical councils, Constantinople II and Constantinople III. And they offer the confession that, and I'm going to quote it, that in the one person of Christ, the natures on account of their union concurring form only one person and hypostasis. Union by synthesis that is not that not only preserves from confusion the elements that are concur, but also tolerates no division. Unquote. So again, it's a, there's a union by synthesis that not only preserves from confusion the elements that concur, but also tolerates no division. Then it goes on to state two natural wills and operations concurring together for the salvation of the human race in one person and one substance concurred. So the one person of Jesus Christ who performed miracles, who suffered, who was born of the Virgin Mary, who became incarnate, um, has two natures, but they're not confused. They're fused, not confused, okay? And they um, operate according to each nature. So one is a divine will, another one's a human will. Now the will, the intellect, the memory are properties not of the person, but of the nature. So Christ, one divine person, the second person of the Trinity, took upon himself a human nature. He always had a divine nature from eternity. When taking upon himself a human nature, not a human person, he no, was not a human person. He was a divine person. He only had one person. He took upon himself a human nature that has an intellect and memory and will. And in so doing, did not experience any confusion, meaning disparity of the divine and the human will. They worked in perfect concurrence, perfectly concurring with each other. However, the human intellect, which is part of the human nature, and the divine intellect were in dialogue, so to speak. And this is evident in several passages of the scripture where his human intellect had to be informed by his divine intellect but they weren't at odds with each other. So the human will, the human intellect, the human memory was always receptive and passive to the divine. And then an example is at the Feast of Cana, right? When the Blessed Mother asked him to perform his first miracle. He said, my time has not come. And it turns out his time did come. So that was a moment when God used Mary, as it were, to inform the son's human intellect that now is the time to reveal yourself as the Messiah. Because he knows once he did the first miracle, there's no getting the toothpaste back in the tube. Once, once, the, you know, once the word's out, it's going to spread all over the, the planet. That's what happened. So he knew that once he did that first miracle, his life will never be the same again. But he didn't know until that very moment in his human intellect that now was the time. That's when the divine intellect informed his human intellect. Like that. Leslie, Leslie, go ahead, Leslie. Um, thank you. Father, can you... Uh, go over again about Jesus being on the cross for six hours. All my life, I always thought it was three hours. I mean, that I've uh, and that he was crucified at the third hour, but darkness came at the sixth hour. But he was actually on the cross for six hours. I, yes. If you com if you compare all the gospels, you get pieces from each one. You right. put them all together. It's it's about six hours he was on the cross because Matthew states that at the third hour. He was crucified. The Which sixth hour, the darkness came. And then the ninth hour, he died. He speaks, this, he speaks of the third, the sixth, and the ninth hour. Matthew. Because I had read something several years ago, and I was confused about someone saying he was on the cross for six hours. And I thought, oh, no, you're wrong. It's only three. But, oh, my. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's possible. It's very likely. Uh, wow. Um, yeah, I know. We, uh, we liturgically celebrate from around noon to three, right? Because that's when right. the darkness was, yeah. But um, it's probably based on the gospel, six seems to be the most accurate rendering, yeah. Oh my gosh, okay, thank you. You're welcome. Eva Maria, go ahead, Eva Maria. You're, you're on mute, Eva, open up your microphone. Ah, yes, thank you. Uh, it's just to ask again, uh, when uh, Father Joseph explained volizione the third uh, um, 
word for will. Uh, volere, volontà e volizione. I and didn't uh, get, quite get it, what it is. The natural will that we all have is volontà. Yes. The accent on the last. Then volere is the operative will, the will when it's engaged in doing God's yeah. will. That's volere. Then you have volizione, which is the informed will. When the intellect is being engaged, not just the will, but the intellect. As well, so there it's really uh, one will, it's not three wills, it's one but different aspects of the will. Okay, ah, uh, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. And we have Richard, go ahead, Richard. Yes, uh, father, I was, I was probing the orthodox view on the nobility of man. Somehow, I came across this long passage, and as I read it. It said to me, these people are divine will people. Uh, it just reeked of the same philosophy and doctrines as in Luis's writings. So my question to you is, do you have any feeling for how the orthodox people react to the divine will? Are they participating in it or are they not? You know, to a large extent. Yeah. Um... First, in Louise's writings, you have a lot of Eastern theology. You have a lot of the patristic theology in her writings. She was not aware of this because she didn't study any patristics. But it's I'd be obvious that the same God who um, actualizes grace through the sacraments in the Eastern Western churches is in the writings of Louisa because you could see a lot of their expressions, for example, divinization, which is hardly ever mentioned in the West or by the scholastics. Aquinas hardly ever mentions it, Augustine hardly ever mentions it, but the Eastern church fathers, they mention it a lot. And this is in fact found a lot in Louise's volumes too. So there's a strong patristic theological influence in her writings, but there's also a strong scholastic Western Latin influence as well. So her writings are very ecumenical in that sense. Um, they're, they're, they're combining East and West. As to the question of how many in the Orthodox are reading this or how disposed they are, I suppose it's pretty much just like in the West. If the Eastern understand divinization better than we do in the West, and for that reason, I think they're open. If they're exposed to these writings, like we would be, that, that believe in the visa. But, uh, the thing about the Orthodox, they don't have the same spirituality that the West do, you know. It's a little different. Uh, but, um, for example, in the hours of the Passion, Jesus talks about how with every word that we recite, if it's done properly, God will give us a kiss, a soul, all right? That's an indulgence. You don't hear a lot about indulgences in the Eastern churches, you know. You find a lot of this in the Western churches and her writings are very much indulgenced. So that would be something that I suppose that I don't think would be a big hurdle for them to accept that. But um, yeah, I think they would be very open. And I know some priests that are, you know, that are not all Orthodox and that do read Louise's writings. I know some of them accept them. Yeah. Father, we're at the end of the hour. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you all. And yeah, I'll ask you all to unmute and say goodbye if you wish. Thank you, Father. Slow no one. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Goodbye, all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Father. Grazie mille, Padre. Niente, grazie. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Okay, and may the blessing of Almighty God descend upon you, remain with you always, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. See you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. <laughs>
Reporting from Vatican City The Catholic Church on Wednesday dismissed as false the miracles attributed to a statue of Virgin Mary in central Italy, which a self-professed visionary said had cried tears of blood. 54-year-old Sicilian Gisela Cardia had professed to communicate directly with the Virgin Mary and to have received the crucifixion wounds of Jesus Christ on her own body. Cardia, who was convicted in 2013 for fraudulent bankruptcy, founded a charity to help the sick funded by individual donors, some of whom later said they had been duped. Bishop Marco Salvi noted that the affair had not increased church participation, but in fact, had shaken the faith of many churchgoers, creating a scandalous situation.